Hi guys. Every once in a while, I make some videos that are kind of just to recap all of the things you've learned so far. And I tend to love those videos the most. I, I, I love to play Connect the Dots because I think that's when things actually all start to come together. And this is definitely one of those videos. Um, dating all the way back to your very, like your second case in, actually your very first case in this curriculum, if we go back to um, Jamie Lopez, Jamie Lopez had a staph infection, right? But remember with staph infections, we talked about the skin properties of it, but you can certainly get gastroenteritis um, from staph. Um, we've been talking about organisms that cause diarrhea for months now, and I'm actually gonna start kind of giving you guys a rest on that. But before we leave it all together, I want to talk about how you're actually supposed to take all of the information I've given you over the last, you know, three months and use it one day maybe when you're dealing with patients. But really what this is designed to help you with are step one vignettes. Um, and the reason for this is that really this is a study in epidemiology. Um, what I'm about to tell you won't really help you if you have a singular patient with just kind of a non-specific bacterial disorder. Um, but what I will tell you is that if you've got a whole group of people, um, you know, 36 people who are all at the same event and they now all have diarrhea, that is incredibly good news for you because that lets you establish a timeline. And this whole video is about using timelines to your advantage. I'm not gonna say anything different from what I've been saying for the past five months. All I'm gonna do is present them in a different light or a different order. Um, this is actually a method that the professor before me, Dr. Lint, came up with, but it really helps narrow down the pathogen in the case of bacterial diseases. Um, when you think of bacterial diseases, there are really only four different scenarios. And these scenarios are really the only ways we're going to see bacterial diarrhea. And they're all based on timing. They're all based on when the disease starts. Um, so let's get into them. All right, scenario one, gastroenteritis one to eight hours after ingestion. Anytime you have a group, remember this only works for groups, and the other thing I'll say is this really only works for bacterial diarrheas. This won't help you with viral diarrheas. The syndromes are too similar. But if we're talking about a group of people who have a bacterial gastroenteritis and it hit one to eight hours after ingestion, it's due to a preformed toxin on the food. That's it, it's the toxin. There isn't time for anything else to act that quickly. So it has to be preformed. There are really only two organisms that make a preformed toxin that's going to cause gastroenteritis. Can you think of them? Think. Talked about them earlier. All right, so I'll tell you. The first one, B. serious. Bacillus serious. We talked about this one um, earlier in the curriculum. Um, sometimes this one is associated with rice held warm. Um, or buffets, right? The other one is Staph aureus. This one we expect to see it on salty food. Um, canned ham is a good example of this or deli meat of any variety really. Um, that's where we expect to see it. So where do we get this? So with B. serious, you cook the rice. It doesn't kill the spores because the spores, remember, are resistant to boiling because be serious is a sporulating organism, right? All right, so the spores are resistant to boiling. The rice sits out on a warming table and the spores germinate. The bacteria grow and they go into log phase and then stationary phase. And then several hours later, like let's say they put the rice out at, I don't know, let's say noon. All right, so this is where they put the rice out. Now you come in for dinner at say five o'clock that rice has been held warm for five hours now. And now as the organisms go into stationary phase, they die. And as they die, they produce their toxin. 
and then you ingest the toxin. And several hours after that, you don't feel so good. So that's the first one. Now, what about Staph aureus? Let's paint a different picture for that. So Staph aureus, we're thinking about salty foods and person-to-person -person transmission. So all that has to happen is for one person, we'll make this person tiny. Why? Because it's probably a kid. Sneezes on it or goos on the food in some way, shape, or form. All right, so here's my food. This kid comes over, achoo, and sneezes on the food. Well, Staph aureus is found in the nares, right? So this little booger here, literally I meant the kid, but it works. Um, sneezes on the food and it stays there. Now I want you to imagine yourself at a big group event, like say a family reunion and everybody's out and you know, they're enjoying the warm sunshine and maybe they're playing, you know, I don't know, a game of tennis or something, um, or flying kites or whatever. Maybe they're going fishing in the lake. They all come over, they have lunch. A couple hours later, after going back and doing more fishing or playing some more badminton tennis, I don't know, I'm not a great artist. But they go out and they do something else. Well, the whole time the sun is up and it's cooking the food out here with the Staph aureus on it. And the people come back from lunch and no one gets sick the first time because the bacteria haven't been there long enough. But once it sits out all afternoon, as the family goes to play some more, the bacteria reach that stationary phase and they die. And that's when they release the toxin. So the thing with these is that it's not really because of the vegetative bacteria. These gastroenteritides are not due to the bacteria. It doesn't matter that we're ingesting the bacteria because both B. serious and Staph aureus, if they were vegetative bacteria, they would die in our stomach acid. It's not the bacteria that's making us sick. It's the toxin. And that's why it's hitting us so quickly. So they come back and they say, I want a little more of Aunt Ruth's I don't know, potato salad, and they have some, and they think for a second, I don't know, is this still okay? I mean, it smells okay, looks okay, tastes okay, and everybody seems fine for a little bit, but they're not fine, because toxins are tasteless and odorless. They're a silent killer. So preforms toxin, toxins one to eight hours after ingestion. I want you to think be serious and staph aureus. Okay, what about gastroenteritis that begins 18 to 36 hours after ingestion? Well, for patients who get gastroenteritis at this point, so we're talking, you know, about two to three days or day and a half or so, we're still talking about a toxin-mediated um, infection. The thing is that in this case, it's toxin that is being produced from bacteria that the patient ingested. Um, so in the first example, when it was happening within one to eight hours, it didn't matter if they ingested the bacteria, they were going to ingest the toxin and that was going to make them sick. In this case, they're going to ingest the bacteria, then as the bacteria die inside the patient, it's going to produce the toxin and now the toxin is going to make them sick. Um, so in this case, the bacteria is actually going to adhere to the epithelium and then the toxin is going to be produced there locally within the gastrointestinal tract. And that's gonna to lead to a watery diarrhea. That's the most common manifestation of this. Um, the most common cause of this in the United States are our vibrios, remember those comma-shaped organisms? And we don't really have cholera in a significant way in the US, but we do have other vibrio species. Um, specifically in saltwater shellfish, we have like vibrio parahemolyticus, um, we also have Vibrio vulnificus that lives in brackish water, so rivers dumping into oceans where oysters and crabs hang out. Not as severe as cholera, but they do both produce um, cyclic AMP-inducing toxins, so you get that watery diarrhea. No fever with these. They're non-invasive and not inflammatory because they're not as severe as cholera, so it's afebrile. Really key to note about toxin-mediated diseases, any of the toxin-mediated um, gastroenteritides are afebrile, so that's another good clue for what you're dealing with. Um, this one's for all of you sushi lovers out there. My husband loves sushi. I don't understand loving sushi when you live in the Midwest. Um, seems like that's a lot of fish out of water for a long period of time. These aren't going to kill you typically unless you have like a severe liver disease or something. Um, like uh, Vibrio vulnificus can cause mortality in liver patients, 
but otherwise you're going to get better in about a day to a day and a half. So what are the organisms we think of beside Vibrio? Remember that C. perfringens, besides just causing myonecrosis, also produces an enterotoxin, which can lead to a watery diarrhea. And then also, we're going to keep B. serious on the list for now. Why? Because it has that late toxin that can also lead to diarrhea. So B. serious is a two-for-one deal. Okay, what if you have a patient who gets gastroenteritis 48 to 72 hours after ingestion? And remember, all of these, they only count if you know exactly when the patient was likely exposed to the pathogen, okay? Um, the organisms I'm going to talk about here, you can see them at less than two days, but really that's only if they have a really high bacterial burden. So on average, we're going to see um, gastroenteritis with these 48 to 72 hours after ingestion. There are four bacteria that cause this. These are the invaders, the tissue invaders, okay? Um, they're always going to cause a dysentery type syndrome. And that means there's going to be blood and pus in the stool. So these are going to be your more, um, more invasive organisms. And because it's invasive, because it's inflammatory, because we're seeing pus, we're definitely going to want to look for fever here. You see fever, you need to start thinking of these guys. The most common cause of an invasive inflammatory diarrhea is C. jejuni. Um, typically, we're going to get this from chicken or poultry, okay? Second most common is salmonella, and in this case, I don't mean S. typhi, okay, but kind of the other salmonellas. Salmonella um, typhi is actually passed human to human, remember that? So instead, we're actually talking about those spread by turtles or other animals, turtles, snakes, reptiles, um, but more typically where we see people getting it from is undercooked poultry um, or eggs. So... Can you imagine eating a raw egg? I mean, most of us aren't rocky trying to gain muscle, so probably not. But there is something with raw in eggs in it that most people love to eat. Cookie dough, right? So I let my son have a little bit of cookie dough. It's probably not a good idea. Now you say the salmonella is on the outside of the egg, and hopefully the shell is not in the cookie dough. But remember, as you break the egg, you're probably going to get some egg on the outside of the shell, and that can wind up in your food. So that's how that one happens. Um, Shigella can cause this, but Shigella is pretty rare in the U.S. Um, it is still common in other parts of the world, so that's why I keep it on the list, um, but we almost never see it. And then enterovasive uh, E. coli, or an invasive E. coli, this is not normal E. coli, this is E. coli that picked up that plasmid, giving it this invasive capacity. Um, looks very similar to Shigella, primarily seen in the third world. The other one we're going to talk about here actually is C. diff. Um, this is the only one on the list that is not caused by ingestion, right? This is an overgrowth. So we're going to see this after antibiotic use, but it won't necessarily follow the same timeline. So it is still an invasive inflammatory diarrhea. It's just not timeline-based. It's entirely antibiotic-based. So just putting that on the list so that you remember that it's invasive, but this one we can't use our timeline for. Okay, we're going to deviate from the bacteria a little bit. If you see gastroenteritis seven or more days after ingestion, it's not a bacteria. That's too long a time. You would have had kind of disease for a long period of time, or you would have had something else going on. If it's seven days after ingestion, it's a parasite, not a protozoan. They have a much longer incubation period. It takes so much longer because they're more complex organisms. Um, the most common cause of gastroenteritis due to a parasite is Giardia, um, so uh, Giardia, Giardia duodenalis, um, and it's kind of the most common protozoan diagnosis in the U.S. It causes disease by attaching to the bed epithelium. It's non-invasive, so no fever. It's just going to coat the dig digestive tract, and you'll get some malabsorption. The second most common is Cryptosporidium. Um, this one is actually really dangerous to the HIV-positive population, where you're going to see that self-limited watery diarrhea in most patients, but in the immunocompromised patients, it's actually really dangerous. Um, so it doesn't typically cause fever in patients, because in healthy patients, it's minimally inflammatory. Um, so in your healthy patients, it's going to be a 7 to 10 day infection, and then they'll get over it and it'll be fine. Um, this one we associate with recycled water. So um, any of you go down to Millennium Park in the summer, 
they've got this great kids play area, Maggie Daly Park, and there's a big splash pad in the middle of it. Or there's also those faces with the splash pad on it if you're driving down Michigan Avenue. Um, they're beautiful, great things, and kids love to run in them. But the water is recycled at almost all splash fountains and water parks because we don't want to waste that much water. So it isn't cleaned properly each time. So all that takes is a kid who has some maybe asymptomatic cryptosporidium having a diaper blowout, and now suddenly everybody is running around the water splash park with their mouths open because, well, that's what kids do, and you can get an outbreak from that. Pretty gross, but it's true. Um, the next one, Entamoeba histolytica. It's invasive. It causes blood and pus in the stool, fever, because it's invasive. Um, this is sometimes referred to as amoebic dysentery, um, so you might have heard of that before. Um, but that's pretty much the three that I would really pay attention to in the notes that were associated with this case from a parasite standpoint. Um, the parasites each have different mechanisms for causing illness, but you can kind of look through the notes to get the rest of that. So that's kind of how you could read a vignette with clues for time of ingestion to gastroenteritis. And I do put my disclaimer down here. Um, everything I said in this video is really related to bacteria or parasites, not viruses. They're just too um, similar and the symptoms tend to come on and leave pretty quickly. Um, so with the exception of rotavirus, I remember with viruses, the ones we've really talked about are noro and rota. So you can go back and review those.